Leia Healthcare. It's good to live. Proud sponsor of the Real Health podcast with Carl Henry. Hello and welcome to Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. On this week's show, I'll be talking all about the six key principles to finding happiness with Professor Brendan Kelly, author of The Science of Happiness, a new book out on the 9th of April. Brendan is here to answer the big life questions like, will having a baby make you happy or just knackered? Are women happier than men? Will earning lots of money satisfy you? And do politics and religion really matter? Professor Brendan Kelly, welcome to Real Health. How's it going? It's going very well. Thank you for having me today. I appreciate it. Listen, we're delighted to have you on. Our listeners are going to be all intrigued about how to be happier. Who doesn't want to be happier after a very tough 12 months? Uh, What is the science of happiness all about? You know, Carl, everybody wants to be happy, but we often lose sight of this. We get stuck into our day-to-day bits and pieces and we we get engrossed in the small things and we forget the big thing, which is being happy uh, and fulfilling, you know, having a fulfilling life. So, In recent decades, scientists and philosophers and doctors and economists have started studying happiness. Now, obviously, there's one big problem. How do you measure happiness? You know, you might be happy right now, but five minutes later, you could be unhappy because something small happened. It started to rain. You forgot where you parked. Um, So, uh, but they've started doing this, studying happiness in large groups of people and trying to figure out Is there a path, a tried, trusted, scientific way to increase our happiness? And you know what? It turns out there is. And as COVID, before we get into you know those key principles, you think COVID has had a massive impact on people's happiness, or for some people, has it made them happier? COVID has has changed quite a number of things, and there's been a whole lot of research about this. It appears initially COVID made us all unhappy, both the pandemic and the restrictions. But now it's it's a little more subtle than that. It appears to have impacted younger people's well-being more than it has impacted on older people's well-being. Um, and there are various reasons for this. Um, and it, 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 it has changed aspects of happiness, but the fundamentals remain, if anything, clearer. The degree to which relationships matter and can adapt, the degree to which activity, physical activity matters to mental well-being. So COVID has changed a lot of things. You know, I'm reminded of something that uh, Bernard Levin, a journalist, once said about computers. He said, computers will change everything except everything that matters, and the rest will still be up to us. And I really like that because in a way, COVID has changed so much in our lives, but it has brought out the important things like uh, relationships, like the value of work, and like the importance of physical activity for mental well-being. Um, so COVID matters, obviously, and some people have suffered deeply, but it has also helped clarify what really matters for happiness. Yeah, so for a lot of people, they realized it wasn't about the bigger and the better. It was about the simple things in life, such as you know their family, their children, their partners. You know, The simple things became more important. Absolutely, and, and uh, things got different importances. If we take work, for example, a lot of people discovered first that they could work from home far more than they thought. But secondly, a lot of people realized the reason they went into work was not actually to work at all. They could do that at home. The reason we went into work was to chat about the water cooler and to, you know, to meet our colleagues and to hold meetings that weren't Zoom meetings. They were in-person meetings where you could make a little subtle signal at someone, throw your eyes up to heaven, be making, you know, have these uh, sort of secret dialogues going on. All this stuff, all these subtle things. That's why we went to work. And that's why a lot of people are keen to get back to work, not to do the work, but to make the connections. And that too links clearly to how, how happy we are. And chat us through some of the global research findings. So some really interesting one came through, one in terms of political views, that those with right-wing political views are happier than those with the left. I'm intrigued. Come on, tell me more. Well, Carl, I mean, I go into this in some depth in the book, which is, you know, the science of happiness. And if you like, the science um, of, of belief, political belief, is very, very clear. People who profess to a conservative worldview um, are happier than people who have a more left-wing or liberal view. Now, this is really interesting, and it makes sense to a point, because, you know, left-wing people, they're unhappy with the state of the world, they're agitated, they want stuff to change, they're out there, they're doing stuff, they're working, and maybe maybe a certain amount of unhappiness is necessary, is important for change to happen. 
Uh, however, for personal happiness, you got to move way to the right. The more right wing you are, the more certain you are, the more black and white you see the issues as. It might be totally unrealistic, but the happier you will be. So I think a lot of people uh, need to reach a balance on this one. A certain amount of disgruntlement with the state of the world is necessary or we'll never progress. And maybe people get political fulfillment from that, but, they, but we don't always get happiness. Um, happiness isn't everything. Maybe dissatisfaction is needed, but we should be clear that the more conservative, the more illiberal, the more right-wing we are, the happier we're going to be. The next one I'm intrigued by too, uh, we have a, just over a two-year-old here. So uh, having a baby increases your happiness levels for two years, <laughs> along with your tiredness levels. <laughs> I mean, have, having a baby is one of these huge big life events. And it's a really interesting one, Carl, because it changes your life. And yet it's a decision that's sometimes not even a decision. It's something that sort of happens and sort of not. But if we look at it scientifically, what we find is um, happiness levels increase for around two years. It starts a little bit before the birth of the child. It lasts for a little more than a year afterwards, but then you're back to your original happiness level. Now this peak is higher in women than it is in men. And the, 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 the return to normal then is, is sharper in women than in men because the rise was higher. Um, but it's present in both women and men. And the solution, if we are to be ruthlessly logical, Carl, is to have a baby every two years <laughs> the rest of your life. Now, I will admit that as a man, this might be easy for me to say, um, but uh, in truth, uh, the, the science says that the, the, the boost in happiness starts to dip a little bit at the third child and subsequent children. So in terms of simple happiness for the parent, um, there is happiness, a burst of it associated with the birth of a child. It doesn't always last. But of course, happiness of the parent is not the only thing to take into account when deciding to have children. It's important, but it's not the only thing. Um, but it, it is important to know that the boost in happiness from having a child isn't sustained indefinitely for the parents. It does, it does diminish after a few years. So I'm sorry to disappoint you on that one, Carly. <laughs> I'm generally pretty happy anyway, pre and post. I'm, I, I'm, I'm ever the optimist, or certainly try to be. This one is interesting. So 47 is the great, is the great, is the age of, of crankiness, basically. Uh, the key unhappy people are kind of in their late 40s. 47 seems to be the mean age. Yes, it is. And this is both bad news and good news for me, because as we speak, I am 47 and a bit. So I am now at the lowest point of happiness. And this is a really interesting research finding. And it's been replicated in hundreds of countries that we start life as children quite happy. Then happiness dips as we enter our teens, our 20s, our 30s. The low point is the mid to late 40s. And then it picks up. So uh, we can end up in later life, if we are healthy, uh, as happy or happier than we ever were, even as children. Now, why this is the case is interesting. It's replicated in hundreds of societies around the world. It's the U shape of happiness through the lifespan. And it's partly because the 40s are a time of great responsibility. Often there are young children, which are, uh, just for the record, a great joy. Uh, how, <laughs> however, uh, we, we have to acknowledge there are, you know, there are burdens with it as well. Um, people are working very hard. Uh, traditionally, people would have a mortgage that they were in the middle of paying off and not feeling they're making any progress with it at all. But increasingly, people are renting and not able to get a mortgage as well. So this is the age of, at, at work also. People are either promoted and have new responsibilities or they're not promoted and they're feeling glum about that. And um, so all kinds of things come together in the mid to late 40s. And psychologically, it's an age when we start to realize that uh, the dreams of all that one was going to achieve in one's life have either been fulfilled or they're not going to be fulfilled. So th it's a difficult time. And it, it, it's what, what's interesting is it's like this in every, pretty much every country, developed, developing, rich, poor, and um, there is this dip. But for me, at the age of 47, as I talk to you today, as I walk in this valley of darkness, there is really good news that for me, it's just going to get better and better. If I can remain healthy, I'm going to start getting happier pretty soon. 
And the reason that older adults give for the happiness of later life is that they just don't care anymore. All that competitiveness and careers and money and all of those things, they don't matter as much anymore. Uh, and greater happiness comes from that. The next one doesn't surprise me because you kind of hear it time and time and time again. The happiest country in the world, Finland. Finland, yeah, remarkable country. Um, indeed, all those Scandinavian countries are commonly in the top five happiest countries in the world. And the reason for this isn't entirely clear. Um, you might almost expect the opposite with many seasons of, with many months of the year, you know, quite dark and deprived of light. But it's very, very consistent now in the World Happiness Reports. The Scandinavian countries have, have high happiness levels. And this seems to be because there is a high degree of social cohesion, a strong welfare state, a strong sense of society, and a, a strong group dynamic, a cohesiveness that isn't present in other countries. And this is borne out by the bottom of the table. When you look at the lowest uh, ranked countries in terms of happiness, there are countries like Afghanistan, where there is real difficulty creating society, creating civic society, um, continual invasions. Um, uh, so, so the opposite, if you like, of the stability and cohesion we see in the Scandinavian countries. Of course, the big question is, if we all moved to Finland, let's say all five million of us in Ireland moved to Finland, would, would we all feel better? And of course, the, the answer to that is probably no. And is there something in that in terms of uh, genetic happiness or predisposed happiness? So, for example, you know, if you're if you're born in Ireland, you're predisposed to being bright and bubbly or maybe not because the weather is not too good. Or, you know, are there or even regional happiness in terms of what part of the country you're born in? You know, does, does that affect it or do we know anything about that? There seems to be a huge genetic component in happiness. Most of the models, the estimates that have been done would say that up to 50% of the difference in happiness between two individuals is attributable to genetic factors rather than anything we do in our lives or choices that we make. So say, uh, Carl, if you and I have different happiness levels, about 50% of that is, if you like, etched in stone, it would seem. Now, it's really hard to know why this would be the case and what we do with this information. Uh, in one sense, it means that agonizing too much over the choices we make in terms of happiness um, it isn't probably worth it. A lot of this is, is um, already determined, um, but it also means we're far from powerless. And it's best to think of the genetic component of this as um, genes give a likely range in which our happiness is likely to lie. And I think we know this, like we probably know bright, bubbly people who are pretty bright and bubbly no matter what happens. And then we know people who are, let's say, not as bright and bubbly and a little bit, little bit heavy to be around maybe. And you know, they could win the lottery and they'd still be in that zone. So there's a certain genetic element. Now, in your question, you were wondering about different areas or uh, I'm not going to talk about different regions of Ireland, except to say that I am from Galway. And as far as I'm concerned, Galway is the centre of happiness <laughs> in, of, of Ireland and possibly the world. Well, anyone I've ever met from Galway but has always been kind of happy. So I totally support you on that. I'm well steered out of that question. I'm very impressed. Uh, in terms of the key principles in finding happiness, I know you, these are the book is all about this, but I thought it'd be great to touch on them over the course of the interview. The first one is seeking balance, trying to hit moderation in all aspects of what you do. And I'm, I don't, I'm, I'm, as I've got older, I've got better at it. But certainly when I was younger, moderation wasn't part of my vocabulary. But it is really important in terms of happiness. Yeah, yes, it is. Um, I mean, we tend to be attracted to extremes. You know, the extreme diet starting on January 1st, the extreme exercise regime because it gives us some kind of physiological buzz. And I mean, these things aren't bad. Um, you know, they, they're, they're nice as bursts of energy. But um, moderation is absolutely the most tried and trusted principle um, of happiness which is sort of doing a bit when you can. Um, a, a, good, a good policy is, is that direction of travel matters far more than speed matters. So that if you're trying to achieve something, taking a very tiny step that you can sustain um, and not taking another step for months is the best way to go. 
rather than making giant leaps and then falling back and leaps and then falling back. So a sense of moderation throughout life is important. Moderation is not the world's most exciting message. Um, you'd like to uh, suggest, you know, extreme experiences as the way forward. Um, but moderation is what contributes to both health and happiness. And, and you know, it, it, there, there is this division in so many of our minds between physical health and mental health, um, which is absolutely wrong. Uh, and moderation helps both hugely. We chatted to James Clear uh, about, oh, I think two months ago, and he's made that whole idea of kind of that 1% rule, so a little bit better every day, that balanced approach, a moderate approach, uh, and coined it with the fantastic phrase, atomic habits, uh, and made it seem very, very sexy and very, very cool. But that 1% approach is a great way to stay healthy, but also to find happiness in trying to stay healthy. It, it really is. And, you know, it used, there are two basic Sort of ideas about happiness. There is the pleasure idea, hedonism, just having as much pleasure as you can possibly fit into every day. And the other idea is to do with contentment and a, a knowledge that, that you are well, that you're you know, paying your mortgage, you're contributing to your pension, you're making sensible plans. And we all lie somewhere between the hedonism end, pure pleasure, seeking pure pleasure, and the contentment, building a steady life. And uh, the moderation is about moving a little bit from pleasure in the moment towards that other side of the spectrum and valuing um, the stability. And, you know, it's funny when you work on moderation and stability and so forth, other people really admire that in you more than you might yourself. So in families, you often find a certain family members go skiting off in different directions and have crises and all kinds of excitement and disappointment, that ultimately they gravitate toward the person who is the steady, moderate family member. And that's an important role in a family system. Um, but we have to be careful not to move too far toward the contentment end, to totally remove joy and pleasure from our lives. That is a joyless life, but moderation helps with a sustainable balance of the two. Okay, next principle of focusing on love for both ourselves. So a bit of compassion and self-compassion, but also love for others. Yes, yes, love is this really interesting thing. And um, it, it, it's something we don't talk about in a proper way. The idea, and I write about this a lot in the book, the idea of love has been hijacked by romantic love, whereby, you know, if you talk about love, you're almost accused of talking about romantic love which is great and really, really important. But there are other kinds of love that we don't value nearly as much as we should. Love of family, love of your work, love of your job, uh, love of your country, I guess. Um, and of course, as, as you point out, self-compassion. We drive ourselves incredibly hard. We have these ridiculous standards that we hold ourselves to. We, we overschedule ourselves, we overexpect. Um, what we can do. We forgive other people for their failings and rarely ourselves. So the idea of love is not just about romantic love, which, which, which is great, but it has, um, it has hijacked the concept of love more than it should. And it's about loving yourself, being compassionate and forgiving towards yourself and re really forgiving yourself, not, not just saying it, um, because we will fail again and again. Um, and also realizing that other kinds of love are really, really important, like love of work, love you know, love of what you do, becoming good at it, becoming skilled at it. That's a real kind of love that is very sustaining. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm keen people would value more. Okay, so it's important not to put too much pressure on yourself. And I think people have learned that over the course of the last year or so, that it's not, you're not striving per, for perfection. You're striving to do your best. And sometimes your best is amazing. And sometimes your best is so-so. And sometimes you nail it. But, you know, striving for that as opposed to that perfection is a really important way to keep your spirits up and be happier. Yes, yes, it is. And really understanding the phrase that good enough is good enough. Uh, it's not inadequate, but, you know, good enough is good enough. Not everything is a spectacular success and nor should it be. Things that appear to be spectacular successes in my life have in retrospect been spectacular failures. So a certain degree of moderation and forgiveness and awareness that we don't always understand the value of what we've done is important. Um, our judgments can be not only harsh, but wrong. The next principle is deepening acceptance. And this is about accepting what you can change and changing what you can't. Yes. So a lot of people will be familiar with the serenity prayer. Uh, grant me the courage to accept uh, what I cannot change, and the courage to, the wisdom to accept what I cannot change and the courage to change what I can. 
And um, there is a form of psychological therapy now called acceptance and commitment therapy, which focuses ultimately on noting all the things in life that we should accept. Maybe we can't change them or maybe changing them would you know, cost us too much, would command too much time and energy. So there are things that it is strategic to accept. And then there are things that we can change. And if we focus on what we can change, we can make a lot more change than we uh, could if we just tried to change everything. So it's about being a little bit selective and accepting certain aspects of ourselves. And this might bring us to why the mid forties are the um, low point for happiness. Just to take a not random example of myself, I, I know, <laughs> I now need to accept <clears throat> that I am balding, that I am a balding middle-aged man, um, and there's absolutely nothing I can do to change that. I need to accept I'm highly unlikely to win an Olympic medal for anything, if I ever was going to. Um, and those are unchangeable things. Now, if I struggle with those things, I mean, I could have decades of unhappiness fighting, fighting my, my incipient baldness, um, but instead, you know, it's very important. I simply accept this and I focus on changing other things in my life, which I can change, like remaining physically healthy, like remaining mentally healthy and all kinds of other stuff that I can do without just knocking my balding head repeatedly against a stone wall when I just can't change it. OK, <laughs> you're, I have to say, you're, you're, you're making me happy just chatting to you. You're, you're a breath of fresh air, which is absolutely I mean, and you're backing it up with science, which is even more important. It's it's uh, it's fantastic. Well, Carl, you know, if I'm making you feel happy, that's, that's really, really important. I'm a psychiatrist, and this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Of course, you're not just smug because you've got more hair than I do. Most people have more hair than I do. Um, and this really isn't a big issue, although it's starting to sound like one the more I talk about it. Let's take it on to gratitude and practicing gratitude. And that's important in terms of both uh, reflecting on both yourself and but also practicing random acts of kindness, which is something that we talk about time and time and time again. It can be important for all kinds of reasons. Yeah, it, it is very important. I mean, gratitude is having some kind of a cultural moment where we have gratitude diaries, gratitude um, books, gratitude classes. And it's important to be grateful for the things we should be grateful for. Uh, you know, the example I gave in the book, which is valid to everyone who reads the book, I think, is being alive. Most people who have existed ever are dead, right? So we are incredibly lucky to be alive, and that should be a starting point uh, for moving on to things in our life to be grateful for. And there's good evidence now that acts of gratitude um, are even more important than feelings of gratitude. So we tend to overvalue thoughts and we undervalue actions. So, you know, some people find keeping a gratitude diary is helpful, noting things to be grateful for, and that's a good strategy. An even better one is doing thank yous to people. Um, now, it doesn't have to be sort of an embarrassing, you know, going up to someone in your family and saying, thank you for being my mother, thank you for being my son. You know, that, that can just get a little bit uh, icky for a lot of people <laughs> who aren't comfortable with that degree of emotional expressiveness. Again, I think we're talking about me, but <laughs> doing something like giving someone something. And this is really good uh, during, during the pandemic, whereby what we can do to, to express gratitude toward having someone in our lives, we can, for example, post something to them in the post. Um, a package. And by doing that, you're not just connecting with the person, you're giving them something. And for a lot of households, you're giving them the event of the day, the excitement of the day, which is the postman coming with a package and you're reaching out. And doing this, the benefit that accrues to the giver is much greater than the benefit that accrues to the receiver. Like we all know that when we give a gift, and if the person genuinely likes it, there's nothing quite like that feeling. It, 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 it's really important for the giver. So gratitude um, really benefits those who give gratitude. And that's one of the principles that I, I've included in the book, uh, which is that we should practice acts of gratitude. Um, even if they're not explicitly so, just reaching out to people to whom we are grateful, it helps us. 
The next principle is fascinating. And before I tee it up, I, I'm going to explain why I think it's so interesting. So Instagram is something I have a love-hate relationship with. I, I'm a scroller, so I can watch TV, I eat my dinner, and I scroll. Recently, I took my Instagram account, on, actually my Twitter account as well, off my phone and placed it on my iPad. So it was, it was a conscious decision to go to it and, and scroll it and reduce my screen time. What I found was my happiness levels, and I'm generally pretty happy, increased as my Instagram use reduced and you highlight that by in terms of avoiding comparisons i think on instagram we all automatically compare it to the perfect world that we see yeah look we're humans it is built into us to compare ourselves with other humans it doesn't matter emotionally it, it doesn't matter how ridiculous that comparison might be you know it could be a totally inappropriate comparison i mean you know i'm a psychiatrist living in dublin if I look on the internet and compare myself to, I don't know, Kim Kardashian, right? <laughs> Logically, uh, it, you know, it would be immediately apparent to me this is not a valid comparison, but emotionally, it will still pack a punch. So I'll be looking at me after a day's work, arriving home wet, dispirited. I'll be comparing myself to Kim Kardashian on Instagram, who has had a team of stylists work, work on her for hours, if not years, in order to produce this image. Um, and yet I'll make the comparison. My logical brain will dismiss it as a ridiculous comparison, but it will emotionally affect me. So the kind of step you took moving your Instagram and Twitter onto a less readily accessible device, still accessible, but just less readily accessible, is really good because it reduces that emotional punch that the inevitable comparisons will have. Now, Carl, your comparisons, you may well come out the better for most of them. You may look at people on Instagram and think, you know, that, that, you know, that, that, that you're, I, I, I don't know, you're, you're, you're more handsome or more intelligent. Uh, however, for most of us, when we compare ourselves with people on Instagram, it's not so good. Um, so making that less readily accessible is a really good strategy. What you did is important, but also keeping the device out of your bedroom, keeping it out of areas of the house, or the ideal, putting the device in the boot of the car at eight o'clock and not touching it um, from 8 p.m. until the following morning is the ultimate way to get yourself free of this. Finally, the sixth one is about believing in something that matters to you. So having something important, presumably that's having like a, a almost like an internal mission statement or, for, or a reason to get out of bed, a reason to go to work, a reason to go for a run. So we would see in weight loss and fitness with clients, what is your reason? What is your why? And that has to be really, really strong to get you to the goal that you're trying to. Yeah, believe, believing in things is, uh, uh, it gives meaning, it gives purpose, it, it, at a basic level, it organizes stuff for you. A lot of people opt for what you might call pre-prepared packages of meaning, like religions. Uh, it's quite, quite easy to just to kind of click into one of those because there's a whole structure there and there's other people and stuff like that. Um, and that's, that, that can be really, really helpful. Um, increasingly, the sort of gap left by religion in people's lives is being filled with things like fitness and, and, and gyms and that. Um, as if, how can I say this? As if that is a belief system in itself, which I, I think it's, it's not a good belief system in itself. It's very, very important to have a personal vision about what these practices are a tool to do. Um, and, you know, sometimes they're a tool for physical wellness mental wellness, or sometimes people are reaching for an image of themselves that can be healthy or that can be unhealthy, depending on how it's approached. So, you know, meaning uh, matters. It matters hugely. It could be political meaning. Um, it could be uh, religious meaning. It could be something far more personal. Um, but we're hungry for meaning. Like, we, 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 we love meaning. We love to believe we're part of something bigger. And broadly speaking, we're happier when we are part of something bigger. The, the psychiatrist Anthony Clare um, used to say that we should try to be a leaf on a tree. We should try to be part of something, be it a movement, a political belief system, a religious community. And when you feel you're a leaf on a tree, you feel a lot stronger and more connected. So that's, if you like, that's, that's the final principle, if you like, finding meaning and sticking. And look, actually, the research on religion shows this very strongly. We used to think religion made people happy because it connected them with community. To an extent it does, but a much bigger factor is believing. It is believing in the religion. 
it has the biggest impact. That's why belief is important. Professor Kelly, before we let you go, I will ask you this. Every now and again, we get a, an expert on the show who I would love to have back for a second episode. And I would love to bring you back on in a couple of weeks when all the promo for the book is done. You have a little bit more time to come back on and join us for a second ep and we can delve even further into the science behind happiness. It's been fascinating getting to talk to you. Remind us uh, the name of the book again. The book is The Science of Happiness. Uh, it's published by uh, Gill uh, Books. It's out on April 9th. It's available uh, as a book, it's available as an audio book, and it contains the uh, six principles of a happy life, the seven strategies for achieving it, and uh, based on the science of happiness, which is the title of the book. Professor Brendan Kelly, the very best I look with the book. No doubt it's going to absolutely fly off the shelves, and hopefully some of our many listeners will pick it up as well. It's been so interesting to get to chat to you, and I really look forward to catching up again in a couple of weeks' time. We can delve even further into some of those strategies. Folks, there you have it. Who doesn't want to be happier in these really stressful times? You've lots of content from today's episode to do. So if you liked what you heard, don't forget to rate and review. And as ever, you're listening to Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. It's Real Health at Independent.ie, at Carl Henry PT on Twitter and on Instagram. And we will see a happier, healthier you next week for more Real Health. Slow and full. Leia Healthcare. It's good to live. Proud sponsor of the Real Health Podcast with Carl Henry.